Okay, we're recording. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, sorry, the, uh, there seemed to have been uh, some confusion, but this is actually a makeup uh, 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 seminar. We got snowed out last time. So, uh, and it's a pleasure to have here Dr. Schwartzman from uh, the STAT Department at North Carolina State University. Uh, Armin was uh, actually comes uh, to us from Lima via many, many different uh, places. Uh, he, uh, he's from Peru originally and went to school as an electrical engineer at the Technion and then uh, uh, got his master's from Caltech. And then uh, he worked for in a high-tech industry in uh, California and then worked, went back to Israel, worked in biomedical signal processing, and then finally decided that engineering is not for him and went into statistics. And where he got his PhD uh, from Stanford University and uh, uh, working on random positive definite matrices and false discovery rate in fear inference in multiple testing and uh, did uh, work in uh, DTI, the, the diffusion tensor imaging. And he also uh, was at the, the biostat department at Harvard uh, at the, and visiting position also at Technion prior to joining a state. His current interests are in uh, the area of uh, statistical signal and image analysis with application to brain imaging the environment. And uh, with that, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for coming. You finally made it. Yes, yeah. yes, finally made it. A nice day, finally. And thank you, Hamid, for the for invitation and for the warm welcome to the campus and to, uh, and to electrical engineering um, as well. Uh, so the story there about going to statistics is that um, I, <coughs> I got into this. That was back in high tech. Um, in a um, company that was bought by Johnson & Johnson, and I was doing some signal processing on signals that were uh, taken from the heart, which some of you are maybe familiar with, electro electrocardiograms, essentially. And for me, it was a big contrast, because before that, I was doing mo uh, modem design for satellite communications, and there, the Gaussian models, everything works so well and so nicely. And once I got these biological signals, basically none, nothing that I knew helped me at all, right? And so that's actually what happened. I was just very curious to understand, well, how do you model any of this? And that's why I thought, well, maybe if I go into, into statistics, I learned that. Later I realized that if I went to do a PhD in electrical engineering, I would have been able to do it too. But at that time, I just didn't know it. Probably. <laughs> huh? Probably uh, yes, because, because once I got the statistics, the first thing I had to do, I had to learn this probability, measure theory, all this. Anyway, uh, so I've become uh, a little bit more theoretical than I ever planned to as a result, but still I, I try to be in the middle and I like theory, but uh, always um, I try to be driven by applications and, and this actually is going to be more theoretical, but anyway, I, um, don't worry, not too many equations. Let's see. So what is this about? The, the idea here is, in general, how to do peak detection. And perhaps everybody knows how to do peak detection. But it's a statistical view of it. Um, so the problem that I'm going to talk about is this problem of finding local differences between images, or maybe when you want to find some signal against noise. And I'm thinking of situations that are, you have a lot of noise. The smooth images with a lot of noise. That's usually what I'm thinking about. But the signals are sparse, right? Uh, and there's two main concepts from statistics that I'm going to bring up. One is the, the idea of multiple testing that happens whenever you're searching for anything and looking for detection. So detection is a, is a if you think about it, a detection is a, it's a decision. It's like an inferential problem where you make a decision that the signal is here or not. Um, and when you do that many times, you create a multiple testing problem. And think about how you can um, use more global area criteria for controlling error. And there's going to be some topology in here where I'm going to be using lower characteristic of excursion sets of Gaussian random fields. So that's the more interesting theoretical part. So I want to start with uh, an example, just to put things in context. This is a problem that uh, I like to do a lot, even more than my kids, probably. Uh, what are the differences? 
it's hard to see, I guess. Maybe here you can. I mean, I, we don't have to spend too much time on it <laughs> really right now. Oh, this is better, for sure. Well, the reason why this is hard to do is because you need to be scanning with your eyes back and forth between the two images, right, and try to compare. But you're really comparing these two images, and you're, in your mind, you're registering them, right? Now, for comp in MATLAB, it's much easier to do this because all I need to do is just put the two images one on top of each other because I register, and they take the difference, and this is what I get, right? And so here, the background is perfectly subtracted, and you get these things, and, and here's the sign and the and the teddy bear, for example, and there's many other details. But there is the teddy bear, for example, is here and it's not there. Okay. So this is an easy problem, I would say, because the background is homogeneous, it's the same in both places. But it can't get harder. This is not moving the way I want to. No, I want to do it like this. Okay. How well can we see this picture? Oh, that's a much better yes. image. Okay, this is a harder problem. You can see that there's noise, and we want to, and there's some peaks, and probably want to take those peaks. Anybody can guess what this image is? Stars. That's a good guess. Uh, let me see. That's a good. That's a guess because it does actually does look like stars and galaxies, but. One amazing thing about our world, uh, I need to, oh, no, 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 no. Oh. No, no, oh, I see what's happening. Okay, there. One, thing, one amazing thing about our world is that the very big things look very much like very small things. The scale of that bar right there is one micrometer. So this is really the inside of a cell. Uh, and this is, it, and so it's a picture inside a cell, and it's so small that they don't call it microscopy anymore, they call it nan nanoscopy now, these days. Uh, so I guess the resolution is, it's if you look at the, every single pixel, it's even below the, the wavelength uh, of light. And so they use a very interesting technique in which instead of just shining light to the object, what they do is they, they shine a laser, a very small, um, with very small intensity, so you can have really like individual photons going one by one, and then they will scatter off the particular molecules, and then those bright spots essentially is what you see. The molecules, are, the, the molecules absorb the photons, and then they release them again. Okay, but we want to find where these molecules are because then we can reconstruct an image of the, these are, but the molecules have this structure inside the cell. Uh, so that's what I want to do. I want to find these dots, and well, clearly, I can't just do peak detection of this image directly. The first thing I need to do is adjust the background. I imagine that that's important because uh, I don't know how to show it, but if you look at it, there's a high intensity in this region that there is in this region. There's even a hole there in the middle. So I'm not going to tell you how I actually did this, but I'm going to do some background adjustment, which is actually a very important piece of what's happening. But now you can maybe convince yourself that the background looks more homogeneous. So the model now is that you have some signals, sparse signal, little spots under some um, background which you could possibly model as a Gaussian random field. Right? And by the way, Gaussian random field, anybody ever familiar with what that means? So Gaussian random field, by the way, it's just, uh, if you know what a Gaussian process is, a smooth Gaussian process, would be, um, it's a, if it's in one dimension, Gaussian process is, is a continuous signal where the marginal distribution at each point would be Gaussian, right? So Gaussian process, and here is in, in a Gaussian field is just for uh, images or higher dimensions. And what I want to do is set some kind of threshold so that I will get those significant points. Why is this, uh, so what is so challenging about this problem? You would think, well, you just set a threshold. You just say plus five standard deviations, that's it, right? That's usually what most people do. But if it happens to you, what happened to me, that if you go into the statistics department, then you learn that, okay, but why would you set that threshold? You, you, don't you want to know how, much, how many errors you're really making? Don't you don't know about your error rate? And is there any way you can 
set these thresholds so you actually control the error rate so you'll know that with certain probability you're making this number of errors, right, every time you do this experiment. For example, if you apply this technique to a video sequence, and that's actually what they do, right, over a long period of time, then how many errors really are you making, right? And so a lot of effort, an immense, immense amount of effort is, has been going on for a long time, I would say 10 years at least, in the statistics community, in the statistics world, to come up with algorithms and ways of controlling error rates in making decisions in these types of problems. Actually, most of the effort that hasn't been in imaging but has been more in the genomics world. And to put things in context, uh, okay, no, no, I'll, I'll get to this. So let me to finish the thought. Uh, mostly in the genomics world, why? Because um, there's something called microarrays, maybe you've heard about. There's these uh, chips that Affymetrix produces that you can give a blood sample and they will measure the gene expression of 50,000 genes at one time, right? Uh, and, and then there's many experiments that go on that trying to de find which genes are actually related to some particular condition, some disease. And then for every gene, you're testing some hypothesis, whether the gene is related to the disease or not related, and there's 50,000 genes, and it's very easy to find false positives. So for that reason, it's been a big effort. And if you think about this problem, let me see if the next slide will do what I want. Yes, it will do what I want. So if you think about this problem, if you're looking for peaks inside this image, but you don't know a priori where these peaks are, you're searching. And a search essentially means that you're going pixel by pixel, and you're asking each pixel, are you a signal or are you not, right? Are you a signal or are you not? You're asking each pixel, each pixel this question, and the pixel contains, I mean, the image contains how many? What's the typical size of an image? I don't even remember what this, what this one is. Uh, I think this one is, okay, 256 to 256. That is how much? You should know that. <laughs> 10 to the fourth, no, 2 to the, 2 to the, 2 to the 16. Right, 2 to the 8th and 2 to the 8th to the 16. Okay. Well, that's the number of tests that there are, and so there might be many false positives, and you need to decide how to set a threshold. So in a very simple way, uh, that kind of setting can be written the following way. So we ask at each location S in the image um, if the signal is equal to zero versus the signal being some, let's say, positive number where mu is our signal. So thinking of a signal plus noise um, model. And well, four outcomes are possible, right? We can have a truly inactive I, I don't know why I'm, well, I'm using the inactive notation from some other context in, in brain imaging, but don't worry about that. But if you see that we have a false, we have a no signal where you may declare it to be, have a no signal, that's a true negative, right? You may have a signal that you do find to be a signal and then you call it a true, uh, true positive. And then there's the other two possibilities, which you may have uh, noise that you call signal, that's called a false positive, or you may have a signal that you fail to find and you call that a false negative. Now, I'm coloring the false positives in red and the false negatives in yellow because depending on the application, these may not have the same importance, right? Um, in a communication system where your alternatives are that you're, that you're sending a zero or a one, then you probably care equally about detecting a zero or one and then it will be symmetric and you care about both. But um, when you're looking for discovery of signal, like in an image that you're trying to discover or find where these molecules are, you care more about false positives than about false negatives. Uh, and that's often the case also in, in, in the scientific enterprise, right? You don't want to declare signal where there isn't, although if you can't really find it, maybe you'll do more experiments and you'll find it later. So it's less of a problem. And so most of the concern is really about the false positives. And why is multiple testing a problem? I just um, attended a talk at the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences yesterday by Jim Berger from Duke, uh, who gave a talk precisely about this issue, of all, all of us about multiple testing, how this is so important and so ignored in general in science. If you do a single test, uh, so in statistics, you may know about the magic point, the magical point zero five number. Ridiculous. 
by the way, and I know I've been recorded <laughs> and I'm saying this. If you declare a false positive of probability 0 0.05, that's a typical scenario. If you do a single test, well, that means that, that if you only have noise, but you declare there to be a signal, then you'll be making a false positive of probability 0.05, Okay, that's not bad. But suppose that we're doing this, let's say 100,000 times. Whether it's 100,000 genes or it's 100,000 pixels in an image, searching for signal, right? Then, just by a binomial distribution, then you'll know that if each one of them is going to have a probability of error of 0.05, then in total you observe you expect to have 0.05 times 100,000, so 5,000 false positives. Right? Probably not acceptable. This type of inference is also what sometimes is called the CIFAR constant false alarm rate, the same idea, right? So the false alarm is, is the error rate that you set for one test. And this means you have a constant false alarm rate in all of them. But when you actually count over a whole number of experiments, what your actual error is, your actual error is, is much more than the constant 0.5 that you set, right? And so what do we need to do in order to guard for false positives? Uh, and I don't know if I convinced you already that why this is a why this is a, a problem. Um, in an image, if you're looking for pixels in an image, that means if there's 100,000 pixels, you will find 5,000 pixels that are significant, even though there's nothing there, right? I think this is the, the issue. So there are global error criteria that can be used, and the most typical one, the most widespread uh, use, I think, is called the, the family-wise error rate. So this is not CIFAR anymore, something else, a different criterion. Suppose that we have a test statistic map, which is a random field TS over a search domain. It introduces some notation. So this is what we're going to base our decisions on. So we're going to threshold this quantity T of S. And suppose that it's all noise, what we call the global null hypothesis. The family-wise error rate is defined as the probability of having at least one false positive anywhere in the image. So it's a global criterion. That means we define as a probability that there exists some location S such that we, the T of S is above the threshold. So that is the definition. Now, um, if you define this probability, this probability will be a function of the threshold. So you can imagine that as you increase the threshold, then this probability will go down. Right? So usually it will be a decreasing function of U. And then if you care, for example, about setting a threshold such that this family-wise error rate is below some number alpha, maybe you want that to be 1% or 5%, then you will find where that curve intersects that level. And I'll have examples of that later as well. What I want to mention is something interesting about how to compute this probability. So now we need to do a little bit of mathematical thinking. It's a probability that there exists some S such that T of S is greater than the threshold. So if there exists some location where the field is greater than the threshold, that means that the maximum of the field must be greater than the threshold. On the other hand, if the maximum of the threshold, I mean, the maximum of the field is above the threshold, then certainly there exists one point, which is the maximum itself. So what I just did is to just prove, prove to you the if and only if condition, that this probability is exactly equal to the probability that the supremum or maximum of the field is above the threshold. And so doing computations, estimating the family wise error rate comes down to estimating or having a handle on this distribution of the supremum of a random field. So what I want to talk about now is how do we actually compute that distribution for images under noise? How do we do that? And it turns out that computing this probability is much harder than you think. Much harder. And it's taken many years of work by these three people that I'm mentioning, um, which I, mean, I really admire because of the work that they've done uh, on this. Just trying to compute that probability when, when T of S is a Gaussian random field. That's all. Um, 
Robert Adler there in the middle. He's a professor at the Technion um, right now, who is an expert on random fields and the probability theory itself. Uh, Jonathan Taylor was one of my advisors at Stanford in the statistics department. And he was a student of Keith Worsley, who used to be, well, he was most of his career at McGill. And then he went to the University of Chicago, and he passed away about three years ago, which was a big loss to science, everybody believes. And especially Keith Worsley was very instrumental because he, he's the one who really brought this in practice. One of the main applications uh, of this signal detection in images is actually in neuroimaging, uh, which is in functional MRI experiments where the, the person is sit, is sits in a, in a scanner, and then as the person is doing some tasks, there's a lot of activity going on in the brain. Uh, I just didn't bring any pictures of that uh, right now, but um, it doesn't matter. You still you also want to detect there what parts of the brain that are that are active actually related to the cognitive task that the person is doing. And then people do these things, these experiments all the time, and then they find different regions of the brain that are active and the different things, and they come up with all these cognitive theories about how this part of the brain does this and this part of the brain does that and how these things relate it. So every time that you have a discovery, like a scientific discovery of that sort, you ask yourself, well, is this real or is it not? Right? And so this issue of controlling for false positives is very important. Uh, so Jonathan Taylor is actually the one who uh, finally came up with a more general theory of how to actually compute this. And I'm going to summarize many years of work into one slide. This is a, this is a very important result. Suppose that T of S is a smooth Gaussian random field. I'm adding now that it's smooth and it's Gaussian, and these two things are important for what I'm going to show. Uh, Gaussian, you know what it is. Smooth, what does smooth mean? Smooth means that it's, I would say, at least twice differentiable, to put it in a s simple manner. And we're going to define the excursion set of a random field above level u. So imagine that you have a random field, and then you set a threshold. That's what we're doing. We're going to be setting a threshold for this field, threshold u. And then there's going to be some parts of this field that are going to be above the threshold, some parts are going to be below, and the parts that are above, that's us. That's a set. And we're going to call it A sub u. We call that the excursion set. OK. And so the theorem, so the, the, the big theorem here says that the distribution of the tail distribution of the supremum, so that is a probability that the supremum of the field is above the level u, is very close to this quantity, which is the expected Euler characteristic of the excursion set. And I'm going to have to digest what this means. But first let me tell you that it's very close in the sense that if you take the difference in absolute value, that quantity will be less than some constant times e to the minus alpha u squared over 2. So that's, that means that it's very, very close. It's a very good approximation. In other words, this can all be computed, but there's this approximation. And whatever this quantity is, the good thing is that this quantity actually can be computed, and it can be computed explicitly. And this was one of the big achievements of the, of the theory. So let me explain now what this is, because it's very interesting. In order to do that, I need to say something about what the other characteristic is. And some of you know it already. Maybe some of you don't. But I like the pictures anyway. And maybe if you, like, maybe if you know it, then you'll like to hear about it over and over again. So what is the other characteristic? The other characteristic, uh, it depi depends on which dimension you define it. Uh, if you are in, in, in one dimension, if you have a set in one dimension, it's just a number of segments. In two dimensions, if you have, any, if you have some closed subsets in 2D, yes, question. Yes. That's for Gaussian random fields, and there's many conditions on the smoothness. So if, if you want, I mean, I can give you more details. There's an assumption that a Gaussian random field is going to be a Morse function with probability 1. For example, you need some conditions, and for that to be guaranteed, uh, you need a certain amount of differentiability 
uh, as well. Like two derivatives, we need con uh, unit expands to be uniformly differentiable. There's many conditions. For it. That's why it just says smooth. <laughs> okay. So in terms of the other characteristics, if you have some closed subset of the plane, then the other characteristic will count the number of blobs minus the number of holes. For example, if you just have one blob, or in other words, a connected component, if you know some topology, then the, this is one minus zero. But if you have a, an annulus like this, it will be one connected component minus one hole, or the character is equal to zero. If you go to three-dimensional objects, then now the other characteristic will be equal to the number of connected components or blobs minus the number of tunnels or handles plus the number of hollows. So what is hollows? These are three-dimensional holes. So for example, if you take a golf ball, which is a solid sphere, there's one connected component, there's no holes of any kind, so that character is equal to one. For a donut or a bagel, I guess that's a bagel, not a donut, that's a bagel. Uh, for a bagel, you have one connected component minus um, one hole or one tunnel, right? And that's equal to zero. So actually, it has the same characteristic, same topologies as this object. For a, I guess, a pretzel will have one connected component with three tunnels in it. So you get minus two. And then a tennis ball is an object that has one connected component, has no tunnels, but it has one hollow, one hole inside. And so they will have an order characteristic of two. And the reason why the other characteristic is so important, in general, you, and if anybody really cares, not, nobody really cares about the other characteristic. I mean, for any application, you really care about the number of connected components. You may care about the number of tunnels. I mean, that's really the topological characteristic you want. These are the Colbetti numbers. But the other characteristic is one that can actually be computed. And this uh, goes back to very uh, early classical Greek theory from, from, the, from the ancient Greeks, that if you have a, an object like this in 3D space, for example, you have a bagel plus a ball, a solid ball, then you can count that the, the only characteristic will be a number of blobs, which is two, minus the number of tunnels, which is one, plus no three-dimensional holes, and that would be equal to one. But it turns out that if you put these objects in a grid, in a lattice, you can also compute the other characteristic as the number of points, the number of grid points inside the object, minus the number of edges, the green edges that connect the structure, plus the number of faces that you have, this grid, and minus the number of solid cubes that are included in this. And it turns out that this calculation actually is exactly the same as the other characteristics. And this is a logical argument for it, but then you can see that now, if you have any object in any grid, like for example, in any image, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, whatever it is, you can easily compute the other characteristic by doing these calculations. This is actually very easy to, to compute. All you need to do is just take the, the grid and just shift it up, down, left, and then you can count easily how many edges there are and faces and everything else. So I said I would explain what is, what is about this, ex, this uh, excursion set and, and why it's important, uh, why it shows up, right? Okay. It turns out that there is a, um, well, you know what? This is not so important. Let me, let me start with this. Here's the toy example. Suppose that we co I construct a random field. This is color-coded, an image, so red is up and, and black is down. Right? It's not Gaussian at all, it's just concocted that way on purpose. And now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to move the threshold from zero up. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to, so here's the threshold U. As I increase the U, I'm going to look at the sets that are above this threshold U. See what it produces. So for a low threshold, this is the original smooth image, for a low threshold, I may get this shape right here sort of Mickey Mouse kind of shape, right? That's the situation A right here. And then um, you can count the, well, basically what we have for this, this excursion set is just one connected component. That's also record is equal to one, and it's right there. As I increase the threshold to two, to about three right here, then I make it a situation like this, 
where now you have three connected components minus one hole. So the correct is two. Now you understand what's happening, right? They increase the threshold even more, then we get to here, and now we have four connected components. And then if we increase it even more, then we only get this maximum here, and we get one connected component as we increase the threshold. So we understand how this works. Now, what is interesting here is what happens what happens at high thresholds. So at a decently high, not too high, but decently high threshold, eventually all the holes that there might be, holes, lakes, and, and things like that, those eventually disappear. Right? Imagine that you're in a range of mountains like that, and you, you have a strata of, of clouds, and you're just above there. So eventually you just have connected components. And if you keep increasing the threshold, eventually you will only have one connected component, which is where the maximum is. And this object will have always another characteristic of one. And if you keep going up, of course, then you'll get nothing if you go beyond the suprema. So the point is that if you go to very high thresholds, then the indicator function that the supremum of the field is above u, so the event that the maximum is above that threshold u, that's actually the, almost the same as the expected, I mean, uh, it's almost the same as the Euler characteristic of the excursion set. Because this excursion set will, be, will have Euler characteristic 1 if the, th if the supremum is above the threshold, or will have 0 if the supremum is below the threshold. So I can establish this identity here. And now, I can take expectations on both sides of that equation. So I get the expectation on the right, and I get the expectation of an indicator function, as you know, is the probability of the event. And so the probability of the supremum is above the threshold, which is exactly the probability that we want, would be approximately equal to the expected Euler characteristic of the excursion set. And there's my informal proof of the theorem. Or is this the case that you need u high enough so that all the higher beta numbers of your expression set to be zero? Is that the, when you say u is yeah. high enough, yes. is that doesn't mean it should be high enough so that all my higher beta numbers are zero? Is this a special case or is it the Right, well essentially that's what happens. This is even higher than that, right? Because the situation on the left is one where already all the beta numbers greater than all the beta 1 and beta 2 up are already zero. zero. Right? So this is even higher than that. Yeah, so this is one of the things that, are, that is happening. Question, is this a special case for the theorem, or is it true that in the theorem, when you say high enough, that u is big enough, large enough, yeah. then that large enough contain is uh, more specifically is the uh, statement that u is large enough so that my all my higher beta numbers are zero. Okay, so what I can say is that the theorem is the way I wrote it down, which is an approximation between this probability and, and this quantity about the other characteristic, right? Now, what you're saying is also true, but I'm not sure that actually, even though it's obviously true, right? I'm not sure if this has really been proven. Uh, and there is, so to what is maybe what you're... Uh so let me put it other way. So can I equivalently state this theorem as for high enough u, the probability on the left-hand side is yeah. equal to the expected number of connected components of the expression set. Can I state it that? I, that's, my answer is no. So. My answer is no, because the theorem doesn't, doesn't really say that. I mean, that's, an, that's, a clear, that's an implication that we guess that should be true, right? But then in, that we have to include what is the probability that beta 1 is equal to 0 or 1 or something else, right? There's also those probabilities involved that are not included in, in here, right? Question so I it's more complicated. The question I have is kind of related to Harisha's uh, question. Is this related to, uh, I mean, th there is a whole theory of the spring value theory, right? Okay. Uh, and, and how is this related to, to that, where you basically, you, you, you can always, you can always find uh, with high probability, what is the supremum of given a certain distribution? With a high probability, what is basically the, uh, the center of, you know, 
and that, that connection and that con what is that supremum of that given of that given realization and, and, and uh, for instance uh, the problem here would be this uh, the supremum of a Gaussian yeah of a Gaussian is given by you know by like the square root of uh, uh, it's proportional uh, to the, the square root of uh, like two log two and log, log, log. Uh, and like right. Yeah. And, uh, is this related? Has anybody kind of looked at it from that perspective? Uh, yes. So in fact, um, I will show in a moment what the, ex what the actual expression for this is. But if you look at the expression, and if you try to solve that equation, you will find that the, the threshold that you're looking for would be more or less have that form. Right. Right? So you can get it from here uh, as well. Right, yeah. Oh, here it is. Yeah, well, it, um, I didn't know I started. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, so the the strength of this is that this expected characteristic is a quantity that can actually be computed, and and there's a formula for it. I'm going to show you what it is. Suppose now that t t of s is a smooth isotropic random field. Now I'm adding a little. Bit condition there that I have isotropy, uh, simply because it's easier to write down the equation in the case of isotropy. So in that case, again, we have uh, an excursion set, same expression. Now we want to know what is the expected characteristic of that excursion set. That is actually exactly equal to this finite sum. Sum from d equals 0 to d, where d is the dimension of the set. So if it's a 3D space, this would be 3. So we have four, e four elements. And it's just a linear combination of two very interesting quantities. One quantity I'm going to call mu sub d of s which is called the intrinsic volume of S of order D. So this is a quantity that, I'm going to explain what this is, but this is a quantity that essentially just measures your search space. S is the search space, which in the case of an image could be just a rectangle, but uh, actually in the case of brain images, it could be some other shape, right, that you're searching. And, and there's another quantity, which only depends on the threshold U, and that is called the real characteristic density of order D. And I'm going to explain what these, what these are. And there's a generalization of this also for non-stationary fields. It's just harder to explain. Okay, so what are these intrinsic volumes? I want to tell you. So these are measures of the set. Um, it depends on the dimension. So for example, let's say we're talking about a three-dimensional object. So the the volume of order 3 is just a volume, which makes sense. The volume of order 2 is almost the surface area of the object. I'm saying almost because you need a factor one half in front just so the formula works out. It's, um, there's a reason for it. That's so important. The, what is mu 1, the one dimensional, is sort of the length of the object. But if the object is not uniform, like for example, if you have a, a rectangular box, right, then the length is not the same in all directions. So you, what you would do is that um, it's what that diameter is, is really the caliper diameter, where you take the object and rotate it in all directions and take the length and, and average them out. Uh, so for example, if you have, as I said, a rectangular box with dimensions A, B, and C, then the diameter would be A plus B plus, what is this? Yeah, so you get twice the diameter is A plus B plus C. Uh, and something curious is that, is that that's, that's the, the dimension that is used to, to control the luggage you put on the airplane. No, nobody ever looks at this, but that, that if you <laughs> look at the sign, that's what they say, that some of the dimensions has to be some number. So they're using the intrinsic volume of dimension one without even knowing. So that's cool. Ah, and what is mu zero, of course? So mu zero is the zero dimensional volume of the object. And that happens to be exactly the right characteristic. There's that. What are these easy densities? Uh, so these actually will depend on the, on the distribution. So this depends on the Gaussianity. For example, so we say, suppose that T of S, this field is Gaussian with, this, with marginal distribution normal 0, 1, and suppose that it's isotropic with certain covariance function, 
So the covariance function will be the covariance of the vector, the gradient, delta t. That's another way of um, determining, right? It's, it's differentiable. So you just take the gradient, that's a vector. The covariance of the vector is going to be a constant lambda 2 times the identity matrix. So that represents an isotropic field. And this constant here is sometimes called the second spectral moment. It's called the second spectral moment because uh, if you actually take the, the spectrum of this and, and look at it in a frequency domain, then this would be the variance of the spectrum. You can also get at the number that way, which is interesting. Um, and then in with this notation, then this uh, density is going to be a form that has this e to the minus two square over two, which comes from the Gaussian, but it also has some well, has some constants in front, has the lambda that I just mentioned, and it has these Hermit polynomials uh, in it, which is interesting. Um, so that's why they're no Gaussian. And it turns out that there's a, the, the theory includes also distributions of this sort for other, for other cases like chi-square, t, and f. But I think the Gaussian is the most important one. All right, so because of the time, then I want to move on to to show you some uh, examples of how this could be applied. So the, here's, here's the toy synthetic example. It looks like Gaussian noise. Well, there's some signal underneath. I'm just not telling you yet where it is. But there's some peaks there that need to be detected. Okay, now you're trying to find them, right? You're looking at their inside to see where they are. Uh, it's hard to tell. I know because, I mean, I, I know how to spot them because I've, I've produced this, but anyway. The, the naive thing to do would be the threshold. This is where I started, right? Half an hour ago I said, well, suppose we just, we have a Gauss, every point here has a marginal distribution which is standard normal, right? So I can find the threshold that will give me a constant false alarm rate of 0.05. That's the probability of being a false positive at each point. But I said, right, if I start with 100,000 points, 5% of them are false positives. And here you are, 5% of the points are false positives. And because that can't find anything, obviously. Right? So you don't do it. Okay. What should I do? Apply your algorithm. <laughs> right. But actually, there's one thing. No, 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 no. Actually, if I do that, it won't work either. There's one thing that. Oh, oh there it is. Okay, okay, okay. Here. There it is. Apply your algorithm. Okay, there it is. I applied it. Uh, well, the noise the way it is, you can probably, you can estimate from the spectrum what this lambda 2 is, and that's the only parameter you really need. You plug in the lambda, so what would you do? Let me explain. So you would, uh, from, from the spectrum, you would estimate what this lambda is. Once you have the lambda, you have this formula. For these quantities right here, all you need is a square. So for a square, it's very easy to compute these. Right? So compute this quantity, compute the other one, put it together into this equation, use that as my function for the probability, and find the threshold. And, and this is what happens. Nothing. Why such a big difference? Because we, have to, we need to understand what family wise error rate is. So we want a probability of 0 0.05, probability of 5%, of finding any false positive whatsoever. Right? So it's very likely that. We, that is so conservative, we're mostly going to find nothing. So, uh, <laughs> okay, so what? Now what, what do we do? Any ideas? Well, there's some, there's some processing that needs to be done before I apply the threshold. Um, this graph explains more or less what I just did, what I was trying to explain. If you do no multiple testing correction, so that means if you do the constant false alarm rate or the constant probability of error, this is the Gaussian probability. And if you set the error at a certain level, you're going to have this threshold, which is about one point. I actually know this number by heart, right? It's like 1.6 or something. Yeah, I don't know. 0.63. Oh, okay. But if I uh, use the distribution of the supremum, it's going to give me this curve, function of u. And if I find the threshold, it's going to give me a threshold of 5.2 which is very high, right? It's very, very hard to cross that threshold. So I'm going to do something else. This. I'm surprised that nobody came up with it. Well, of course. That was my next guess. Well, of course, <laughs> right? Of course, what you need to do is they need to apply filtering, right? Uh, and, and it's amazing how, I don't know, this is just so basic and, and, and it's easy to overlook. It's 
I, I think that from the time I was an undergrad, I did undergraduate electrical engineering, and one of the things I found most amazing is the match filter. It's one of the most, I think it's one of the single most powerful techniques that there exists. Um, so here's what happens. So I apply a Gaussian kernel with a radial standard deviation of 0.4 on this scale. And now I smooth it out, and now look what happened. Just doing that smoothing, it's generated a random field that looks very different from before. It's actually very smooth, right? But now these, there's some high things that are starting to appear, right? Now, because I did the smoothing, then it's even more important, right, that, or even that I use that distribution of the supremum because it's built precisely for that, right, for, for smooth fields, because you use my constant smoother. And so now, I need to apply the, um, that formula with the new covariance function that I obtained from the, from the kernel, which I can even compute theoretically, right? And that's going to give me this curve now, this new curve. And now this new curve calls the threshold at a different threshold, which is about 4. And this is, by the way, standardized still to be between 0 and 1, right? And Oh, let me see. Let me just go straight here. Here, this is what I get. So what happens if you use a different uh, different kernel? In other words, a different variance for the kernel. How sen in other words, how sensitive is that? Uh, uh, is it's that not very sensitive, and I don't have the results to show you uh, now, but... Um, First of all, more important is the size of the kernel rather than its particular shape. Okay, although in this two example, the shapes are more or less Gaussian, there's a Gaussian filter, so it actually is a match filter. It's not too sensitive really to the width of the filter. As long as you know roughly what it is, you'll get a more or less flat power function. And the error will be, be controlled. Actually, the error is always controlled because for whatever filter you use, you can always, you will, that will affect distribution, right? So the distribution will be adjusted depending on how much filtering you, you applied. So the algorithm will always control the error. The question is one of only of power, how much power you can get. And the ma you maximize the power if you use something that is close to the match filter, but roughly. But you, there's no concern about error control. And so these are the three peaks that, that survive the threshold. And, well, and that's the signal that I started with. Those are the peaks. They were embedded underneath. So, well, three of them were detected. The other two were not. But there's a probability of error. There's, you know, there's a limitation. I chose the example like this. Sometimes you might get lucky, sometimes not. Uh, but that's the idea. And what I was trying to do is also illustrate that part of the difficulty of the problem is that these peaks, they don't all have the same size, right? So you couldn't really come up with a, with a uniform match filter. You could come up with a match filter for this one, but then it wouldn't be matched for that one, right? So that's another problem. So in real situations, you may have to compromise and just find some filter size that works for most. But that's, that's the why it's good that the power function is more or less flat, because then you don't suffer too much. Have you looked at uh, using a set of uh, kernels? Or different in yeah. yeah, of course, that's scale space, yes. Yes, that's a very interesting idea. And that, that has been worked out, uh, actually. The problem is that if, so what is the scale space field? Are you familiar with that? So you take an image and you use a bank of kernels, right? They're too young. <laughs> too young to know what scale space? <laughs> it was hot in the 90s. Oh, well, like this? Oh, then, then I'm coming here, what, 20 years late? I'm late, I'm lagging behind by 20 years in my research. Is that what it means? <laughs> no, no. It just means that they didn't know about it. That just means that it's very old. <laughs> <laughs> and probably, and probably so am I. It just means that they're too young to know about it. Yeah, but probably so am I. I'm not too old too, and I'm talking about it, right? Um, so, yeah, so what happens there is that even if you start with a stationary or isotropic field, so an isotropic field, this is much easier. If you start with an isotropic field, once you do a scale space uh, field, then the new space that it generated, it will be a field that would have one more dimension, which is the, the scale dimension, and that field will be highly non-isotropic, and also non-stationary. It's just much more complicated. So it doesn't have any stationary properties or anything like that, so it's just much harder to work with. That is the main uh, difficulty in applying this.
but it's something that, that I definitely want to explore uh, and see. And, and so one of the solutions, um, this is more of an introductory talk, but if I ever come back and I tell you one more specific, you know, specific papers and results, then, um, yeah, we start to come up with distribution theory for, for maximum of non-stationary fields where you can apply it for some to scale spaces and things like that. Okay, um, so we're almost uh, out of time. So I want to explore some other ideas. Are there other the questions up to now? Yeah, please. So do you have any results on you know, the energy and the signal to the variance of the noise and what's the property of error if you do this? Uh, yes, yes, and yeah, I don't, Right, I don't. I don't have those results to show you right now. But in specific, uh, if I get more specific into the model and everything else, then I can show that actually the optimal bandwidth, if you try to maximize signal to noise ratio, right, the optimal bandwidth is not exactly a much filter. Turns out that it's a little bigger than it, and, and, I, and the reason for it is that the the match filter is really the optimal solution when you know where the peaks are. You just don't know if it exists or not. So as an example, you know, suppose you have a communication system. You're sending signals, everything is synchronized, and you know when to hit, right? And when to sample. You have a sampling rate, the synchronized, you know when to sample. And so you know that that's when you're expecting the maximum. And so you just have to decide whether it's a zero or one, or a plus one and a minus one. In a situation like this, you don't know where, where, the, where the signal is, and that's the most, most the difficulty. There's a, there's a spatial search to it. And it just so happens that because of that extra complexity, you need to smooth a little bit more than you would if you knew where the, where the location was. That's something that happens when you have a signal to noise ratio. It's interesting. OK. Anything else? Well, let me uh, maybe bring up a few more uh, ideas here. If there is time, I don't know. Is there is time? Yeah, 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 okay. Five okay, maybe I can use the five minutes for a few of these things. So more uh, ideas on the error criterion. Well, so what I showed you right now is family-wise error rate. So that's a very well-known error criterion. But I've been thinking about other ways of defining error that might be more useful in some cases. So for example, again, just to make things easy, suppose that we have a global null hypothesis that we, are, we just have noise and then we define the excursion sets the same way. The family-wise error rate what's defined as the probability that there's any false positives at all. So that's the same thing as the probability that the excursion sets are non-empty. Right? So any even a little pixel that you get over there that is very significant, it will, it, it's called a, uh, it will be called a false positive. But maybe you don't care about individual pixels. Maybe you really care about regions. Right? And that may happen in some situations as well. So I can define something called the area of false positive rate for example, which will be uh, defined as the expected area of these excursion sets. Why not? Right? It turns out that this quantity, for example, is much easier to compute. Why? Because if you do a calculation, uh, it will take me two lines to, to prove it. But it's easy to show that the expected area, it happens to be the same thing as the integral of the marginal probabilities of the region. So interestingly, if you care about controlling the area of the false positive, it's just based on the marginal distribution. And in fact, uh, if the marginal distribution of T of S doesn't depend on location, so for example, if you have a stationary field, then you can just compute this as the marginal probability times the area of the region. So that's something interesting. And here is a topological error criterion for another idea. Uh, again, same definition of the excursion set, maybe you don't just care about the probability of getting a false positive or not, but maybe you care about counting how many blobs are you finding that are false positives. And this is especially important when you're looking for peaks that are, that are distributed, right? They're a certain region, right? But if you find a blob, if it's a little smaller, a little bigger, it doesn't really matter as long as you found it, right? And if it's bigger or smaller, it's still counted as an error. And I think there's many, many problems in detection in images where you can imagine that you're trying to detect either, I don't know, I don't know, is it an enemy tank, or I don't know what it could be, right? But uh, MRI. or an MRI, where there's a region. Breast, breast MRI, right? We're trying to find uh, a polyp or a tumor, right? And so in that case, you may want to 
uh, control what I call the cluster false positive rate, which will be the expected number of the number of kinetic components of that expression set, the expected number of beta zero. Now, this is hard, right? Because beta zero is very hard to compute. But as we know from before, we said that at high thresholds, the other characteristic will be either zero or one. But if you go to high thresholds that are not that high, you're in a, in a regime in the middle where the other characteristic actually counts the number of kinetic components. Right? I think you were referring to this idea uh, as well. And so if you can get into this regime somehow, uh, from this regime and on, right? Because even here it counts the number of kinetic components. So from this point and on, then we can say that the beta zero is approximately equal to the other characteristic. And then in that case, the expected other characteristic actually counts the expected number of kinetic components. So I can use the same formula that I had before to actually control this error. And it would be this idea. So if we go back to this graph, um, this is the graph of the smoothing um, with the family-wise error rate. I mean, that's that actually not the family-wise error rate. What I'm plotting here is the, the expected other characteristic. That's what I'm actually plotting. So before, I was thresholding it here, the level 0.05. But now if I think of this as representing the expected number of character components, I can say, well, maybe I'm willing to tolerate um, half 1.5, what, 0 0.5 connected components. So, so then in average, I'll get, uh, what does it mean, 0.5 connected components? It means the expected number of component components is 0.5. That means that half of the time you get one maybe, but it depends on the distribution, right? But depending on how many you're looking for, maybe if you're looking for 20, maybe you're getting one once in a while, it's an okay error rate to tolerate. So it depends on the definitions. But I can threshold this here instead of here, and that allows me to get a smaller error rate, I mean a smaller threshold. And if I apply it in this, for example, that I mentioned before, then it brings the threshold down just enough so I can find the five that I was looking for with one false positive, right? So I think that's very nice. Okay, I think because of the time, then let me, well, go to some of the issues here. The smoothing, I already talked a lot about the smoothing, um, and I mentioned about the match filtering, right? Uh, why the match filter? If your bandwidth is too small, then you have high noise variance. If the bandwidth is too large, you kill your signal. It has to be somewhere in the middle. But uh, I mentioned that the, one of the issues is the search. But the other issue is too that because you don't, you don't know where this, these peaks are, you may have overlap between them, and that can be a, a problem. Like for example, when you start smoothing, you can change the topology of your signal. Something to be careful about, right? Like for example, here is a situation where if you have two peaks that are close to one another, and then you threshold them, you can still distinguish them. But if you start doing smoothing, so this is. I mean, this will be the match filter, or even smaller than the match filter. You can easily blob these two into one. Um, so I think there's a problem. I don't have a good solution for it uh, so far, but it's something to think about. All right, so let me summarize. The problem that I set out to solve was to find local sparse signals in smooth noise. And I mentioned this issue of multiple testing, right? Family-wise error rate as being a one error criterion that is used, and maybe you can interpret um, also expect other characteristics in terms of the cost of false positive rate. And I mentioned how the, the topological properties are important in here. And I wanted to mention just one other thing, which is that there's also all the methods, and this is very general, right? But um, there's many papers that I've worked on too that explore all the error criteria, like for example, the false discovery rate, which is another way of getting results that are less conservative. There you're talking about the expected proportion of false positives among positives. So that would be something like this, that if you find, if you have 20 objects that you find, but your false discovery rate is controlled at 0.1, then you always expect 10% of your findings to be false positives. Sometimes that is more intuitive and more useful. A lot of activity in statistics about this quantity. Um, I don't know why. And then, and the other idea that is interesting is the idea of using local maxima. So, so far I've talked about distribution of the supremum of the whole field. But if you're looking for peaks, then you may do smoothing and then find local maxima. 
And that's something that's very intuitive to do, right? You find local maxima in the threshold of the local maxima to be your peaks. But then in order to do that, you need to know what the distribution of local maxima is. And uh, we've done some work on trying to figure out what the distribution is also, which is very interesting. And we talked about the scale space, et cetera. So, well, uh, that's it. Any questions? Anything else? This? Oh, thanks. thanks I'm going to record it, I forgot. Thank you. We have time uh, for a couple of questions. Yeah, Jennifer. Jennifer. Um, so for the main property that you're using about how the... Speak up, please. And, uh, oh, yeah. Into that. Uh, One of these things? Okay. Yeah. Um, the main property that you're using about how the expected Euler characteristic um, at those really high threshold parameters, so your excursion set, you know, is related to your probability. Right. Um, is the expected Euler characteristic known for all threshold values? Like, it, I mean, is, are there yes. theoretical results on that? Yeah. Right. In fact, right. where is it? Let me, let me get there. Yes, here. This equation, this equation is actually an equality. It's not an approximation. This is holds for all thresholds u, from minus infinity to plus infinity. And so, do they also have any results on the distribution of the other characteristic, or just the expected value? <laughs> if Robert Adler heard you ask that question, <laughs> so he, he would say. Oh, that, that would be my dream. Like, he, he would say something like mm -hmm. that. that he's been working 30 years in this field, and no I way. Whew, even, <laughs> <laughs> even worse. No, it's so hard. Yeah, it's so hard to get any statistical properties. Actually, this is almost at the limit of what, what can be done in probability theory for random fields. Uh, and it's amazing that still new results come up, even though people think that that's it. We can't do any anymore. Um, and topology that, uh, uh, yeah, people that get interested. That may, be, that may be possible. Yes, but we're trying to estimate. So expectations, so you can do things like even expectation of number of local maxima, for example, of a field, things like that maybe can be done. And it all depends um, on smooth and isotropic, right? Well, for, isot for isotropic, it's much easier. For non-isotropic, that's where it's really hard. Uh, my postdoc, for example, he was able to get a result on the on the variance of the number of local maxima of a uh, stationary field, and that was hard. But, but that's the extent of what it is. So expectations, yes. Betty numbers, no. But I think one thing that is that they're trying to do now is to say is to try to find those regimes. For example, maybe there's a high regime where for high thresholds, high characteristic is close to the bet to beta zero, for example, or maybe somewhere in the middle. I mean, there might be a regime where the state where, where most, most of what you see is, is holes and handles. And maybe that regime, the characteristic, will represent some other betting number. And so trying to find approximations that way. Another, uh, and I can mention another thing that for this, the, for this equality, you can actually trace a whole curve and something else that has been done, not about detection at all, but just to show statistical properties of fields, is take some random field. Like, for example, um, cosmic background radiation from the sky or, or some big field like that, and just uh, compute ex empirically what the, what the characteristic is, and then it, the expectation is see if it really follows the curve or not to, to determine whether, for example, a Gaussian distribution would be appropriate for the field. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>